Morning to you this morning and welcome to Forest Heights Baptist Church here at 804 Tanger Drive, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. If you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with us to Matthew chapter 1 and we'll start at verse 18. Our focus will be on verse 23 this morning, but we'll begin in verse 18. As you're turning there to Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, I want to welcome you and tell you to come on out and join us anytime. We're here on this Sunday before Christmas, uh, and uh, you're welcome to come out and join us. Uh, we're having a sing tonight at five o'clock. Come on out for that cookie exchange as well. And uh, we have meetings here for prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. You come out, join us for that at six. Uh, and Sunday mornings, uh, uh, regular Sunday mornings, we have Sunday school at ten. Our worship begins at eleven. If you have your Bible this morning. And, uh, and your turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Allow me to read that down through 25 this morning. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and shall give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to the son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Gave him the name Jesus. Jesus is... Uh, uh, also, uh, the same as Jos uh, Josiah or just Josh. I'm sorry, Joshua, and uh, and also we realize that here in this he got he's got the name Jesus, which is a uh, same as Joshua, which also he gets the name Emmanuel. And all and wrapped up in all of this is uh, something I want to point out to us this morning. I want to look at this morning. Here we are in 2021, at the end of the year. We're here to. Uh, uh, anticipating Christmas coming up right around the corner. And uh, it's uh, not like any Christmas that I can remember. Uh, we're entering the third year. I don't know if you know, but I looked it up. We're starting here soon, the third year of a global pandemic. We are divided as any time that I can find in, since the Civil War. Uh, we're facing global threats from uh, enemies of freedom. Uh, we're challenged from within by anarchists at an unprecedented levels. Uh, we are allowing our personal freedoms to be slowly taken away by our government. Perversions are being taught as normal to our youngest children. Christianity is seeing the lowest levels in the country since they've been tracking. It. We see evil called good and good called evil. More and more people are rejecting the God of the Bible to pick one of their own choosing. And by the way, I just read this week that Christmas is no longer the most anticipated look forward to holiday. It has now become Thanksgiving. I find it hard to wonder what people are thankful for without Christmas, but I understand they probably have many answers for that. What is the word from the Lord this Christmas? May I say this without any equivocation or hesitation, Verse 23 tells us God is with us. That's the word from the Lord. God is with us. What does that mean in the face of all these things and many others we could have listed? What does it mean that God is with us? Well, I think if you take your Bible and look with me in verse 20, the first thing I would say about that is that it, that it is a gift from God. That Christmas that we uh, celebrate in various places perverted pagan ways is a gift from God. It was all about Jesus coming, God's gift in his son. Verse 20 says that it was from God, that it was from the Holy Spirit. 
He didn't come from space. He didn't come from natural conception. He didn't come from somewhere else or any place else. He didn't get conjured up in the mind of anyone. It was from the Holy Spirit. And that is a very powerful uh, thing to think about. The trouble we have today in the midst of all of these many things and all of the vast things that will happen the next week or so here to celebrate Christmas and all the confusion about what it is and what it means and all that Christmas trees and candy canes and Santa Claus and presents and all those things. And no matter how you spend that, it is meaningless and is definitely pagan if there is not something from God there. If God has not brought something to us, then it becomes nothing but just another pagan holiday that people celebrate any way they want to. The Bible says that this verse in verse 23 that we were focusing on, God, is a, is a result of something the prophet said, a fulfillment of a prophecy. That prophecy is found in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And here Matthew tells us what it means. God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. And so therefore, there is no Christmas without God. And if you have a Christmas and you don't have God, then you have something else. You have the pagan holiday, Saturnella. You have some other invention of your own mind. And I would suggest that none of those things will solve world problems. Remember that in the time that Jesus was born, the world was in turmoil. I know that it, everything is worse now than it was then. That's why if you ask anybody, that's what they tell you. Well, I wasn't there then and I'm here now. And that might be why I think you and I may, we may think it's worse. But guess what? There have been plenty of bad times. And that was a bad time to be a Jewish baby. I don't know if you realize or not, but you can read a little bit more. I suggest you do that. But you will find out that the ruler of the world, as it were at that time, for the, at least the, the world of the Middle East and the Mediterranean, spent a lot of extra time killing a bunch of children uh, to find out, to try to kill Jesus. So apparently he thought it was a big deal. He thought it was something important. He was willing to take risk of killing all the children in, in that town uh, under the age of two to uh, try to get Jesus because he feared him. And yet God sent someone into that world, that kind of world, that kind of leader, that kind of problem. God is the only one who could do that. God is the only one. The Holy Spirit is the only one who could make this happen. These are beyond the scientific mind, beyond the world of science. God exists and God made it happen. It was a gift from God. That's what the gift is this year. That's what the gift is. So you know what? I want to let you in on a little secret. God's gift is not in a container in Los Angeles shipping port. God's gift is not, caught, is not stalled out because of a pandemic, because of inflation. God's gift is still available today because it's God's gift. And God superintends over that. Paul writing to Timothy in the first chapter in the 17th verse, he said, and it's kind of a praise thing. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Paul was broke out in the first chapter that he writes to that preacher, Timothy, uh, his, one, of his, uh, one of his students, one of the people he mentored. He writes there at the end of the first chapter, he gets so excited, he breaks out into a, into a praise to God, the eternal, immortal, invisible, only God, honor and glory. Folks, this morning, you can, uh, you can choose to honor God or you can choose to honor the world, but you can't have both because they are mutually exclusive. God does not support. God is over it all and God understands it all. And we are here, but we are not here, I hope this morning, because the world has decided to have a celebration. We're not here this morning because Santa Claus came. We're not here this morning because of Christmas trees and candy canes and lights and tinsel and Tiny Tim and all those things. We're here this morning because of God. God has a gift. And if this world with all those things I listed 
It needs something. It needs God with us. I'm here to tell you this morning, in spite of the world, in spite of the rampant paganism, in spite of the fact that people have turned their back on God, that at this time in America, our country, my country, your country, is the lowest level of people claiming to be Christians. And furthermore, the holiday of all holidays has suddenly taken back seat to Thanksgiving. I'm thankful. What could they possibly, how could that possibly? Well, I'm thankful that I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to go down there and participate on Sunday and I can do what I want to. I'm thankful I don't have to give any of my money that's eaten up by inflation to support the ministry of the work. I'm thankful this morning that I can live with my wife and my girlfriend and my boyfriend all at the same time. I'm thankful this morning that we live in a country where we can kill children before they're ever born and call it a great idea. I'm thankful this morning they might be saying this morning that I can marry a man and I can, or I am a woman, I can marry a woman and the country will celebrate. I'm thankful this morning I can have a child out of wedlock and everybody's so tickled to death they don't know what to do. I'm thankful this morning that I can go around and tell everybody else what they ought to be doing with their life. Somehow or other, listen to me this morning. God needs to be with us. We need God. Amen. We need God this morning. Let me tell you something. God's not shook up about it. God's not sideways. He didn't get up out of his chair. He hasn't, he hasn't been anywhere on vacation. The Bible says that God allows us to think these things because apparently we won't listen to him unless we have suffered tremendously at the cost of this. That we, unless we somehow turn, and even then people will curse God. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that there will be a time when hailstones and brimstone or whatever you want to call it, whatever kind of hell rains down on the physical earth and on physical people, that they will still look up and curse God. By the way, they'll have to look up because they will be kneeling. The Bible says everyone will kneel under the hand of the mighty God. Well, guess what? Good news this morning. Also, because God is with us, he can save us from our sin. The Bible says in verse 21, with, if you will, he said, the reason where I'm coming, the reason I am with you and the reason I've come to you, Joseph and Mary, the reason I'm asking you, Joseph, to do something that goes against the world and the Jewish religious practices. The reason I'm asking, he says, is because here you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Jesus and he is going to save People from their sins. Listen to me, folks, this morning. One thing we definitely need. You might need this. You might need that. You might want this. You might want that. That might be either one or both of those. But we all need to be saved from our sin. Because our sin persists. Our sin separates from a holy God. Our sin separates from the, from the blessings of God. Our sin is what keeps us in a constant state of turmoil. It's kind of like, as we said earlier today, it's kind of like you go down and you have a symptom and the doctor treats the symptom, but you won't let him treat the cause. It's like you have a virus on your computer or like you have a COVID and we can't ever seem to get to the root of the cause. We can't stop it because it's ever, you know, the next thing here, by the way, this is never going away, not unless God intervenes. It goes from a pandemic to an endemic. I didn't know what that was. So being a curious person, uh, I like to look it up. An endemic is a continuous state of something. It continues on and on. Now, we, but don't, don't, don't panic. Don't freak out. We have plenty of endemics. The flu, that's an endemic. It goes on and on. We have flu. We, get, we manage that every year, right? We take, nobody has to wear a mask, not yet, because the flu. The flu's been around forever. When they figured out it was a flu, it never goes away. And you just get some vaccination for it, and you kind of go on and, and, you know, that helps you minimize the symptoms. Then we don't, we didn't stop having to fly on airplanes. We didn't get locked up in our house or none of this stuff. But, you know, people are so ignorant. They know what Kim Kardashian does. They know what Britney Spears is free, but they have no idea what else goes on in the world because, well, nobody told me that because it doesn't suit the purpose. And so the government constantly puts us in a bind, takes away our freedoms, and we give it up like it was free. There was nothing to it. Good news is this morning that we can free ourselves from the burden of the sin that constantly torments us and says, you're afraid, you're afraid, be afraid, be mighty afraid, be really afraid. Let me point out something that the Bible says in Isaiah 8, verse 11. If you're writing it down, I'm going to read down through 17. 
This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. This is what the prophet has said. The Lord has told him. Verse 12 of Isaiah 8. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. For the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble and they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony of warning. Seal up God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. What was the word that Isaiah had there that God said to him? He was saying, listen, it was a word to his people, to the people of God. He says, listen, you are counting on the wrong thing. You are following and chasing these conspiracies. And I will tell you, forget it. You're afraid of this country and that country. You're afraid of this invasion and that invasion. You could name a million other things. They all were human beings. They had a bunch of fears. They were afraid of everything. I'm sure there was some inflation. They just didn't know that. We didn't use that word. I'm sure there were lots of shortages. After all, they were under attack from Assyria. Listen to me, folks. This morning, he says, don't let that stuff drive you around. He says, guess what? Those things will be a put you a stumbling block. God will be a stumbling block. You know what? God is a stumbling block. Jesus said they will stumble. He said to his own people, you stumble over me because I came to save you from your sin and you don't think you're a sinner. I don't know how many people I meet that whenever you ask them about Jesus, all they want to do is tell you how many times they went to church. Well, not all of them because some of them only goes once or twice. The creasters, we call them, right? Christmas and Easter. That some of them don't aren't interested. They just don't want to talk about that. They won't tell you about how they never done anything wrong. Liars. Right? They won't talk about how wonderful they are and how many people they did something for and how many people they did this for and that for. All I want to know is what did Jesus do for you? Has God with you? Is he God? You know how that, that works? You have to accept that. Joseph had a choice when the angel of the Lord came to him and said, listen, Joseph. I know that it's a that that if your wife has been unfaithful to you, that you uh, they stoned her. They, that's what they would do. They would stone them. That wasn't a when Joseph was talking about being quiet about it. He was talking about keeping her from being stoned. We we'll just keep this to ourselves, and you know I'll get rid of you because you've been unfaithful to me, and I won't make a big public thing, so they'll take you out. So that's what they did. And that was the ultimate thing. Joseph had a choice. The law said, do this. This is what we're doing. This is wrong. And he had a choice to believe God or not. Everybody has a choice to make. Are you going to believe God with us? Are you going to believe God came to us because we couldn't go to him? We couldn't build a building tall enough. We couldn't fly a rocket ship high enough. We couldn't figure out how to get to him. And he came to us. And that's assuming that everybody wanted to get to him. And there was a time and there are times and plenty of times when people would like to get settled up with God a little bit, but they, you know, they have a different way of going. They won't listen to what God says. God says, you can't come up to me. I'm too big. You can't do that. I'll come to you. Not because you wanted to come to me even really. And what some, everybody gives up too soon. You know, that's what happens to us. The government has learned and we have learned and we've been trained to give up. Everybody has a give up place. Everybody wants to, you'll go along, go along, go until they take, keep taking stuff away from you until you give up. You know that in this country, we give up way too easy. There are people in other parts of this world, human, regular people who live in other parts of the world, speak other languages, live in different cultures and wear different clothes and eat different things that will give up their life. They don't want, they're not, they're not automatically saying, here, come kill me, but they're willing to read a piece of the Bible to get together secretly to talk about what God wants for them and to trust God in the midst of a bunch of a, a culture that says that anybody who even thinks about doing that will kill you. Do you know that in North Korea, they, they kill people for pretending to be Justin Bieber? What do you think they're going to do if you pretend to be, if you think you'll fall on Jesus? I mean, really? 
It's amazing to me that we here just give up for anything. We'll, oh, yeah, come to, yes, we'll, we'll, please take our money. Please take our freedom. Please take our church. Please take away our ability to get together. Please take away the right we have to talk about Jesus wherever we want to, whenever we want to. Please take that away. And the church is so complicit in the whole thing as a, as a body, as a, group, a gross group of people, we're willing to sell out anything. Well, the government, you know, it's okay. We'll accept this. We'll accept that. Because after all, we got this big building to pay for. I'm so thankful we don't. That we're not, but listen, it doesn't matter if you got a big one or you don't. You don't, you, we should not allow that to trap us. The, there are people, everybody knows that when we put ourselves in a bind where we're trapped and we can't do what God wants us to do, what are we doing? What, why? Because we're holding on to something that we won't let go of. God says, I'll save you, Peter. Just reach out your hand. <laughs> Come on out of the boat. Where was the rest of the guys, by the way? They were all in the boat going, that guy's an idiot. He's going to get out of the boat. And Peter got out and, said, and he said, come to me. And he came and he got there and he started looking around, right? He goes, oh, wait a minute. I'm on water here. There's nothing I'm standing on. I'm not floating. So my goodness, and starts to sing and Jesus saves him. Listen to me. Jesus understands. People say, well, you just don't know how hard it is. Listen to me. We all have our problems. We all have our sins. We all are sinners. The Bible says so. And we've all been there and done that. We may not have all done the same thing. We may not have all done exactly the same thing. We may not, but we've all been sinners. And they say, well, you know, God doesn't really mean. Je the Bible says Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Listen to me. Jesus knows, as I have said before and others have said, Jesus knows more about temptation than anybody in this room. Anybody who's hearing me on the video. Anybody. He knows more about it. You know why? Because he resisted it all the way. He never gave in. None of us know how far that is. When you have given in, that's as far as you got. Jesus did not give in. And he understands how hard that is. And he still loves us and wants to help us. He don't want to help you keep on doing it. He wants to help you stop. He wants to help you get on down the road. Move on. Let's go on. He understands. He will, he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from sins. Listen, are you one of his people? Oh, Brother Robbie, I'm not Jewish. Neither am I. There's a whole bunch of people who think the only people who are going to get saved is Jewish people or Methodists or Presbyterians or Baptists or this or that. Listen to me. It ain't got nothing to do with that. It got to do with what God, what God will you give your life to Christ? He said, those who know me, I know my sheep and they answer my voice. Listen to me this morning. Are you answering God's voice? Are you really telling? Listen, I, you don't have to convince me. What you need to do is talk to Jesus about it. He knows. Well, and, and people want to tell me like somehow that counts. Listen, I'm okay. If you got to tell me something, tell me something. I mean, but you understand I don't have the ultimate story. I don't have the insight that God has. I don't know the things that God knows. And I can't see in your heart. And as quite frankly, I'll just be honest with you. I don't even want to take a look. You know, because after all, I mean, I was, I, you know, it's not for me. It's not my domain. I'm willing to let Jesus be Jesus. Let God be God. Because he said there is no other and I'm not crowding him out in me. I don't, I don't want Jesus back on the cross. I'm willing to say he was on there and he don't have to get, he don't have to get off for me. He got off for a whole bunch of me. He got off himself. I'm not climbing back up there for him because I can't do no good. Listen to me this morning. God is with us. We need it. They needed God with them then. In the right time, the Bible says God came. They always needed. They were always sinning. God was with them. He, this Old Testament, God was following them around. That's a whole example. It showed them what to do, and they went against him. He came around and showed them again what to do, and they went against him. People died, suffered, plague, plagues, pandemics, wars, pestilence. All kind of crazy stuff happened. 
Same as this happening now, just different clothes, different language, different group of folks. But they all did it. We, people did it. God says, I'll come. I'll help you. You have to do it my way. I, you, have to be, you have to do it the way I want to. Verse 23, we focused on. He says, you know, what, what does this mean this morning? What does it mean in the face of all these troubles that God is with us? It means that God is going to be with us. God can be with you. He wants to be with you, by the way. He wants to. That prophet who prophesied that in another chapter, chapter 58, verse 11, said this, The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a scorched, a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your frame, and, he, and you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. What does that mean? What was the word? What was that about? Is everybody going to turn into plants? Everybody going to be dirt? No, that's not what he means. It was an illustration of what God did. God is going to meet our needs. God is going to, he knows we live in a place where the world is messed up. After all, it, it, he created everything. And when people sin, this is what happens. And when Adam and Eve sinned, he kicked them out of the place where they had everything going their way and out into the rest of the world because apparently they didn't want to listen to him. This is what happens. When people don't listen to him, we get this. And it's not just we, it's every person gets it. Every person gets that sort of chaos that evolves in our life. It comes up all the time. It causes us to always be in struggle. He says, listen, I can fix that. I can, I can make you... Uh, not feel good in a sun scorched land. We're in a in a country that you know. I, again, I don't. I don't. I'm not one of those people who calls that. This is the worst it's ever been. Well, I've never been ever. I haven't been around since ever. Okay, and I'm pretty uh, fair uh, study of history, and I suppose that that's kind of egotistical and arrogant, which is, goes along with the way we are anyway. Have been always humans. That is. That there have been plenty of times when other people at the same point in history standing around going, well, this is the worst it's ever been. And this is what I want to know. Okay, I'll say this to people. If this is the worst it's ever been, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Forget about whether we're going to argue about whether this is the worst it's ever been or not. I mean, I have mine, you have yours. But the point is, what are you doing about the worst it's ever been? Well, I can't do that. It's just, I, 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 you know, this is the way we are. We focus on the worst and we can't see anything else. And in that day, Joseph had a dream and he said, listen, Joseph, this is the worst. If you were about to get married in that time and place, man, nowadays it's a whole mess, a different, whole different thing. But in that day, if you were about to get married and your wife was found with child and you weren't in on that. Or even if you were, that would have been a bad thing. But you weren't in. No, no she, was, she was unfaithful to you before you even got married. That was a big deal, personally. I'm ashamed to say it's not a big deal now. But whatever, that was a big deal. That was a serious matter. Personal thing, a personal thing. Notwithstanding that the king, that the ruler of the world that time in the, in the Mediterranean area there was a nut and all the Roman emperors were pedophiles and perverts of the highest order. It was a common practice as much as it is today. I know that we're shocked and awed and we just can't there. There's never been a time. Yes, there has been. Perverts and weirdos and all that kind of stuff have been around since the beginning of time. And they have been out there perverting things and telling people these things and promoting this stuff. And societies were killing their children a long time before we come up with the idea. And, it, and by the way, just in case you was wondering, God hated it back then. Matter of fact, in the Jesus day, they had turned the place where they used to have the temple of child sacrifice into a garbage pit in the hopes that people would never forget what a horrible thing. The Bible even says such things should not even be spoken of. And I risk spoken of them to y'all because, listen, if we don't say this stuff, people act like, well, you know, it's just this and it's just that. God is with us. 
If you are with God, God is with you. He says, listen, I'm coming to save you from your sins. I'm going to be with you, Joseph. Don't let this bother you. Track on. Go do what you need to do. I got this under control. Just stay with me on this. God says in Jesus, when Jesus came, Jesus came and says, I got this. I'm with you. I am here. Listen to me. Well, listen, I'm telling you, it, it's if people in the day of Jesus walking on earth, standing right in front of them, telling them this and telling them that and showing them stuff and pointing to the scriptures where they made mistakes and errors and how they interpreted it and clearing it up for them and then doing things that be, go beyond the natural science and are called supernatural things that couldn't be done by anybody. And he did that and people said, well, I don't really believe that. I'm not terribly shocked when today when people say, well, I don't really believe that. That didn't change anything. Jesus still did them. People still came back to life. Jesus went to the cross, died by every standard known to man. He was dead as dead could be. Put him in a grave of that time, which was sealed up as tight as anything you could tighten up, put some guards on it. And the next thing you know, he popped up out of there. Whoa, hallelujah. And walked around and saw them and scared him his own disciples. I pray that I won't be, I hope. Now, I can't promise that because I don't want to step over in my, but I pray that Jesus showed up that I wouldn't be as shocked as they were. If I see somebody pop through the wall, I'll let you know. Let me tell you something. Jesus is alive. He's still with us today. He's here to save us. He's here to help us. The Bible, again, in Isaiah, the great prophet who said these very words that are quoted here as God with us said this, a favorite verse of one of you all I know, Isaiah 41, 13, for I am the Lord, your God, who takes a hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. The next time you're scared to death, the next time the government is trying to scare you into doing something stupid, the next time society and culture is trying to scare you into accepting something that's evil and calling it good, the next time they try to make something out of that, they try, listen to me, you cry out to God and say, listen, I want that, I, here's the hand, God, grab it. Please get a hold of my right hand. He says, because I have got you. I have got you. And by the way, in case you think that somehow or other that runs out. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, the last verse of, the, of this book that we're reading from this morning, Matthew 28, 20. Surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. And you say, well, Robbie, that was, you know, that was then and now then what? Well, listen to me. I understand. He told them, listen, I'm with you guys until the end of your age. If you want to, if you'd like for me to make that a, a comparison there, their age was going to end. They had an end. We all got an end stamp on us. I know that's a scary thought. The closer I get to it, the you know, more real it becomes. But listen to me, we got when the Bible says God has numbered our days. It's written down in the book. He knows. He knows all about it. And he's on top of it. And nobody, he says, who belongs to me will be snatched out of my hand, not by death or anything else. He is in charge of that. So listen to me. I'm not ready to catch the bus out yet, but let me tell you something. When the day comes, I will not say the government took my life. This person took my life. That person took my life. This thing took my life. Or that took my life. I'm going to say it was God's day. And I'm saying, hallelujah, come on home. I'm home, Lord. How's it going? been waiting to get here listen to me we're not stand by the road and wait for the bus that's not what we're supposed to do we're to live in our life every day you know why because i know the lord's got it all figured out he didn't ask me to figure it all out he just asked me to live every day live it today live it without fear live it because i am with you folks we need to remember there's some easy verses to remember there's some easy parts of verses to remember. I don't know which ones you remember. No, I have a terrible memory on this kind of stuff. But you know what I can do? God with us. And if that's too much, here's an easy one. Emmanuel. First off, you'll be speaking a foreign language. And secondly, you'll be saying three words instead of one. Or one word instead of three. I mean, when the next time the fear mongers come, wherever they come from the big place up in the world up there at the tower of ivory tower or they come from next door they come from inside your own house 
They want to scare you into something. Listen to me. You just say God's with me. God's with me. I have it on good authority. Folks, the authority is the word of God. God said it 800 years before this. And he says it again here. And he's saying it again and again. I am with you. I am with you. What does that mean? God will forgive your sin. Who else can? Who else can really forgive your sin? Who else will make you feel clean and whole? You know, the problem most people have with sin is they're carrying it around because they won't let God forgive it. They, 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 they somehow they're, have, they're having a doubt. They just don't think that it's that easy. Well, it ain't easy. It's hard. Jesus died. God had to come down here from wherever he lives in that holy place down here and mess with us. Get into muddy, muddy dirty, miry clay. Have people spit on him and kill him and all that. He, had to, he came, but he did it. You know what? So it ain't easy. However, what we need to do is we need to believe he will. That's the trick right there. It, and I hate to say trick, but that's the key. You've got to believe he will. And when he forgives you, who will restore you but God with us? The only one who can restore us. It's not just enough just to forgive us. He has to restore us. As we studied this morning, renew our mind. He has to change us. We need to be changed. How do you do that, Robbie? Well, we, got, we, we claim God with us. God is with us and he will do it. He will make it happen. Who will be with you when everyone else has abandoned you, either for what reason or because of death? God remains. He stays with us. He is with us. Pete, you know that there are millions upon millions upon millions of people who have died since Jesus was here. When this word was spoken by Isaiah, before it, had, before it was spoken here by Matthew, it was millions of people had died. God was with us. God is with us today. God's with us then. So he remains. He is above it all and beyond it all, and he remains. He is the, he is the guy who's, who, who is outside of time. He can look at it. I know that's complicated. I can't explain it. Don't even, don't even try. I used to try to figure it out. Here's what I'm going to say. It's a fact. He was here before the beginning, so he started it. He'll be here when the end comes because he finishes it. Who's going to be with you when you have your trials? When you suffer and struggle with all the things that come along in life? God. God will be with you. Yes, we have people in our life that may be with us and help us out. But who can help us in that darkest place, that deepest place in our heart? We're down in there where we struggle when we close the doors and shut the windows and lay down at night. You, we have our people with us, the, you know, the real people, the physical people with us. But who gets, who gets us? Who can get in there? Who can work on that part? Listen to me, that's where it, it happens. That's where God lives. He works there. You know him as your Lord and Savior. He is, he has taken up habitation with you and he is working. You call upon him. Who's there in your celebrations? God. Well, I was all by myself. No, you weren't. Unless you chose to be by yourself. If you kick, if you, God, if you say, I don't want anything to do with God, then he won't, he won't be there for you. If you call upon him, he's there. He's there. If you've called upon him as your Lord and Savior, he's with you everywhere. Even when you don't think he is, he is. Even when you don't know why he's doing this and why this has happened, he's there to ask him. Maybe he'll tell you, maybe he won't, but guess what? You need to know God is with you. Who will you trust with your life? There may be people in our lives that we trust in this world, or this world, this life with our physical life, but who's going to trust, who we trust after that? God. God with us. God is with us. You know, God will be with you this morning. This could be the first Christmas in your life that you can say without equivocation, without hesitation, without doubt that God is with me. You know why he's with me, Brother Rob? Because I'll tell you why. Because I cried out to him and he said, yes, I've been waiting for your call. I dialed him up on the God phone. Came along before there was iPhones and other things. And he said, I called up and I, you answered. You can imagine the shock. God says, I was waiting. I've been by the phone ever since you came, waiting for you to cry out to me. Call up and yes, come home, my child. 
I'll forgive your sin. I'll put you on the right path. I'll make you a new person. And I'll help you live the life that I want you to live. I'll help you accomplish the things that I want you to accomplish. I will help you face down these challenges and these fears and anxieties. I will help you. I'll be there celebrating when nobody is. And I'll be there to usher you in to your new home. I'll be there. We'll all be singing. We'll all be shouting. We'll all be praising. We'll all be happy. We won't be worried about the cares of this world. God says, I'll do that. This could be that first Christmas for you this morning. And let me tell you something, dear Christian friends and brothers and sisters. If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've already said that. Listen to me. But I understand the world is a polluting place. It pollutes us. And I'm ashamed to say that there are plenty of people standing in pulpits that will pollute us. And there's stuff that we can get people to listen to me. I can't defend them no more than I defend myself. What I'm going to say is this. God will help you sort it out. But you've got to ask him. You've got to believe that he is the source material. Go to the word and source it there. Let him help you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Benny Hinn ain't the Holy Spirit. Robbie Harris ain't the Holy Spirit. Joel Osteen ain't the Holy Spirit. Joyce Myers ain't the Holy Spirit. Billy Graham is not the Holy Spirit. God rest his soul. Let me tell you something. God is still working. He has not took a vacation. He's still helping people today. If you will cry out to him, he will help you, brother and sister Christian. He'll get you right. He'll help you put away these things that have troubled you. He'll help you put behind you. And by the way, you know what's behind you, right? The stuff behind you. Leave it there. Leave it there. Quit picking that junk back. You, t you know, this is like the hoarders, right? You take stuff to God, ask him to forgive you, and he says, I'll forgive you. Lay it down right here. You lay it down, and you go, I don't really need that. You walk back off with it. Let it leave and stay there. Let God forgive it. He wants to. He wants to forget. He, he has. Just leave it there. Be forgiven. I don't know how it's, you know what the hardest thing is to live a forgiven life sometimes. To believe that you're forgiven and live that way. Live with your eye on the prize. Live with the high call, as Paul said, and we press on to it. Yes, those things happen. Yes, that was me. Yes, that was there. Yes, yes, yes. And praise God that he's forgiven me. And that's what matters. And maybe some other people have too. That's great. But guess what God has? And I need to go on. How he has things for me to do now. Living a forgiven life is a great witness. A life that's fearless. Not because of selfish ego or boasting, but because of God's presence. These are all things we can have this Christmas that we didn't ever have before. You might not have had it before. Maybe this time you're looking for something different. You're looking for a child. We're, you know, we're here where we are with all these anxieties being foisted upon us by the world through the social media and the newspaper and the news media and everybody and your neighbor and your friend down the street and the guys at coffee house and this guy and that guy they're, they're all being foisted upon us because of uh, because i think god says i just want to see if y'all really want to trust me or not i'm gonna see if y'all gonna really come i want to see if you really want that or not well i tell you what i don't want to live like that i don't want to and you know what god says i don't want you to when me and god are in agreements i'm like oh wow this is cool so god what do you want just let it go i got it. Take a hold of my right hand. Take a hold of my right hand. Just keep your eyes on me and don't let the waves bother you. Don't let the COVID waves bother you. Don't let the political waves bother you. Don't let the inflation waves bother you. Don't let all of that. You name anything you want to. And I'll help you. That's what we can have this Christmas. That's what you can have. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us question you have to answer yourself more is God with me and I'm fine with God would you pray with me Heavenly Father this morning we thank you now we pray that you'd guide us in that we pray Lord that you would make that real in our life we pray this morning Lord that we would know God is with us because we've asked Jesus to come into our life we've asked Jesus to be Lord we've asked Jesus to forgive us and he said he would I pray this morning Lord this would be a different Christmas a different year a different day, a different hour, whatever time we have, Lord, that it be different because we have come to realize.
and come to accept and come to join that you are with us. And we believe it and we're living it. We ask it in Jesus' precious name this morning. Amen.